so you enter into this building you brought your burdens brought your pain but I have a message for you today that when you leave here you won't be the same oh so you tell me you've been to your physician look at you there's been no change in your condition but reach out and touch the master's role there's healing for your mind oh your body and all your soul oh god can heal oh yes he can deliver he can mend your your brokenness as a miracle to fit your needs once you will receive oh hallelujah thank you Jesus God knows all about your situation mm. but with every test and every trial there is revelation that God is able to supply every one of your needs he's here to touch you heal you oh he'll set you free oh yes he will god can heal oh you can deliver lord can mend your brokenness as a miracle to fit your need once you trust oh, you will receive oh thank you Lord so by the time that you leave this building, mm, my prayer for everyone in here is that you'll have your healing. And once God works that miracle in your life that you need, go tell the world tell the world what you have received oh god has oh, oh, oh. you have delivered lord you have mended my brokenness a miracle to fit my need so praise the Lord oh praise the Lord oh praise the Lord yeah you have you have received Thank you, Lord, for your 
your many blessings you bestowed upon me. I receive, I receive, I receive, I receive it, receive it, receive it. I receive, I receive, I receive, I receive it, receive it, receive it. morning and happy new years to our sisters and brothers this morning we're so grateful to have this opportunity to gather for our annual jubilee celebration and to our muslim sisters and brothers we say assalamu alaikum to our jewish sisters and brothers we extend the shalom of our god and to our Christian sisters and brothers, we extend the peace of Christ as we commence our journey into 2019. Amen. Let us, isn't it good to be here? I want to thank President Rose for the opportunity to host our gathering today as we commence our journey together. I'd like to invite you to extend your hand to the individual seated next to you as we prepare now to go to God in prayer. As we join our hearts and hands in solidarity with heads bowed and eyes closed, and most of all, our hearts humbled, Let us pray. Our gracious and great God, we are so impressed with you this morning. For as we gather on this occasion of Jubilee, we recognize that you alone have fortified us since those weary years of waiting for the news of emancipation and exodus. You alone reassured us through those seasons of silent tears. And so, God, we pause this first day of a new year to offer thanks for bringing us thus far along the way. Where others have faltered and failed, you have granted your favor and faithfulness your goodness and mercy have shown up in policies and personalities that have shaped and informed the hopes of our brighter future and our more perfect union. And so, God, we just want to thank you. We thank you for the shoulders of our ancestors, from Moses to Martin, from your daughter Esther to Ella, upon which we are privileged to stand this morning, God, we say thank you. We thank you in particular for the way in which you have weaved into the tapestry of our struggle uh, the contribution of the NAACP for its history of advocacy and its ability to remain united in heart and spirit and purpose since 1908. 
And so we who are here gathered today, Lord, we've become the beneficiaries of their uncompromising battle for justice and social equity, a battle that continues to be waged in our day of false facts. And so we thank you for these modern day mountain movers that are represented in this sanctuary and even beyond this space today. God, we want to thank you for the many opportunities for advancement that they continue to create on our behalf. Uh, leadership like that of Richard Rose, who while we are sleeping, they find themselves dreaming of ways to keep our hopes from dying unborn. And so we thank you. Thank you for the commitment of this NAACP as they seek to create a just community for all. And so God help us not to get weary in well-doing Help us to keep on striving to be the change that we all long to see in our city, our state, our nation, and in our world. Let us not forget the needs of your disenfranchised and disinherited children throughout this city, across this nation, and around the world that you have privileged us to populate. Help us to remember those who remain vulnerable to oppression, manipulation, and neglect. And so our prayer this morning as we join our hands and hearts is that this time of jubilee will serve as a time of inspiration and a reminder that you have called each of us to be children of light for those whose lives are less jubilant. We thank you for our honorees today, and we pray, God, that they would be a source of inspiration, a source of inspiration that will continue to raise up not simply a thousand, but tens of thousands points of light that we too may be a candle to those who sit in the darkness of fear and prejudice and bigotry and ignorance and hatred and lethargy. Oh God, be the glory of all that we seek to do, working in and through us your will for a beloved community that you've created for our good and your glory. To that end, bless now this assembly May the bounty of your blessing aid the furtherance of our service to thee and all of humanity. And God, as we join hands, remind us that you never call us to engage this struggle alone. And so as we gently squeeze the, nave, the hand of our neighbor, oh God, we pray that you would breathe into them all that we shall need to continue our journey through this year. In the name of that one who invites us to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, we pray. Amen. And amen.
Good morning. I'm State Senator Nakima Williams, and it is my distinct honor to welcome you to the 2019 Jubilee Day celebration. I welcome you in this new year to embrace the theme, United We Shall Stand, by living the mission statement of the NAACP in your everyday lives to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality and rights of all persons to eliminate racial hatred and discrimination. I welcome you in this new year to uphold the theme, United We Shall Stand, by advancing the vision statement daily of the NAACP to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights and there is no racial discrimination. United We Shall Stand as we welcome this new year and a new opportunity to continue to live our ancestors' wildest dreams. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here today for the occasion. 1863, 156 years ago, we received the promise, the promise of emancipation, the promise of freedom. And today, 156 years later, we are still waiting for the promise. But just like our ancestors, on that great day, we don't sit by waiting idly. We are demanding and speaking truth to power. We are making sure that the least of these are prepared for. That is the requirement, that is the request. We are here to say boldly to those that would drive us back, whether it's in the White House or the governor's house, we are not going to take one step backwards. So I welcome you to 2019. 2018 was a great year. We had a lot of victories, a few defeats, but we marched on in some of the biggest protests this state has ever seen and some of the biggest victories this state has ever seen. But we're not done yet because we are demanding equity and equality in 2019. So whether your name is 45 or Kemp, you need to be careful because we are ever vigilant, ever watchful, and we are here demanding justice and equality that our ancestors were promised. So today is the occasion to celebrate and tomorrow is the occasion to march, to protest, to shut stuff down, to speak truth to power, and to remind everyone within the sound of my voice, like I said last year, this is the last time that an elected official will hear a please from me or my association. You will hear demand, whether it's inside this building or across the street at the other one. So I welcome you to 2019 Get ready, it's gonna be a wild ride. Thank you, the occasion. Good morning, um, you have to forgive me, my voice is very uh, taxing. I've been doing a lot of singing. You know, we were in watch night service last night, and we had several occasions last week. So just bear with me. I'm going to sing a song that we all can sing together. So I'd appreciate if you guys would help me. <laughs> I know you will, Happy Preacher. <laughs> Come on, put your hands together like this. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. A hallelujah. Talk. 
talking with my mind. Say on Jesus. Yes, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stay on the Lord. Oh Lord, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stay on Jesus. A hallelujah. Keep your mind, Lord, stayed on. I said that it ain't, ain't no harm to keep your mind. Yeah, stay on the Lord. Well, ain't no harm to keep your mind. Stay on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 One more thing. I'm singing and praying with my mind. Sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm singing and praying with my mind. Stay on the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm singing and praying with my mind. Stay. Oh, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, Lord, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Yeah, glory, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, Lord, everywhere I go, Lord, I'm going to, yeah, 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 yeah. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. You know, every, everywhere I go, I've got to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. And you know why I'm going to let it shine? Jesus gave it to me. Yes, he did. I'm going to let it shine. My, 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 my Jesus gave it to me. Yeah. And I'm going to let it shine. Ain't no harm to shine. Jesus gave it to me. Yes, he did. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. We read in our ancient text, the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. We read, Adonai said, the suffering of my people in Egypt has indeed been revealed before me. I have heard how they cry out because of the harshness of their slave masters and their pain has been revealed to me. Yes, we have evidence of slavery in the Bible, the way in which we ought to treat slaves, the rights of slaves, and the limited authority of slave owners. But I know, I am certain, that the spirit and the essence of Judaism, of any sacred religion, demands the abolition of slavery. The Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, merely tolerates the institution of slavery because it was commonplace in that place and at that time, but it is perceived as an evil with restrictions and governing laws that were a means to its eventual eradication. The suffering of my people in Egypt has indeed been revealed before me, says Adonai. 
I have heard how they cry out before me because of the harshness of their slave masters and their pain has been revealed to me. So too were the cries of those enslaved in America through the 18th and 19th centuries. So too was their pain and suffering revealed and yet all too many of God's children refused to hear their cries. The anguish of their brothers and sisters, children of the same God. Why so? Why when we're taught in our sacred text, and you shall remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God took you out of there with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, were we so distant from that experience that we forgot our own torment and suffering? Where was our compassion? Where was our understanding, our historical experience of exile and redemption, as well as our ethical consciousness? Immediately after the creation of the world, seven days of God's handiwork, we read, this is the book of the generations of humanity, or the children of Adam. The statement does not talk about black or white or Jew or Gentile, but just humanity. Since all of us are human beings and all of us share a common ancestor, we must then by extension be brothers and sisters. Thus these biblical words proclaim the essential message that there is unity in the human race. United we shall stand. Therefore no child of God has any right to own or subjugate another child of God. That is not what the Lord wants of us. This is not how we walk in God's ways. And finally, through struggle and much suffering, distress and loss, finally, on January 1st, 1863, brought about emancipation. We are taught in Deuteronomy that you may not return a slave to his master when that slave seeks refuge with you. Let not one ounce of freedom achieved 156 years ago, let not one ounce slip away. Let not one politician, vigilante group, elitist or zealot take from any people their freedom to live as a free people. Judaism has many beautiful symbols such as the mezuzah on the doorposts, the Hanukkah menorah, the prayer shawl and the six-pointed star of David to name a few. Yet there's only one symbol that represents God, and that is each person. As Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel taught us, more important than to have a symbol is to be a symbol. Each and every person can consider themselves a symbol of God. This is our challenge, to live in a way compatible with being a symbol of God to walk in God's ways, to remember who we are and whom we represent, and to remember our role as partners of God in working to redeem our world. For united we stand. In a culture of narcissism, uh, put downs, power plays, and just plain ugliness. There is a countercultural word that steps into the fray from the Word of God, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. I read it this morning from a contemporary version of the message rendering of the Word. Here is what God says to the culture this morning. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's work with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head doesn't force itself on others, 
isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this word as it speaks counterculturally to a culture that is going awry. I seek refuge in God from the accursed Satan, and I begin in the name of God, most gracious and merciful, reading from the Quran, chapter 5, verse 8. O you who have attained faith, be, be ever steadfast in your devotion to God, bearing witness to the truth in all equity, and never let hatred of anyone lead you into the sin of deviating from justice. Be just. This is the closest to being God conscious. And remember consciousness to God. Verily, God is well acquainted with all that you do. And surely God speaks the truth. In the Quran, the Creator speaks of the importance of justice. In Islam, to be just is to be of those who emulate the prophets that have come to us who gave us their messages. This gathering represents the honoring of the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed our people from physical and political captivity but did not give our people humanity, for that is God given. If a man can give you freedom, he can take it away. There were people in captivity who were physically chained, but mentally and spiritually free. We stand on the shoulders of such people. I call myself a movement child, I was born in 1955. My earliest memory of struggle was the boycott of a local store in Chester, Pennsylvania, led by the local NAACP leader, Stanley Branch. This act of resistance made an indelible mark on my young mind, and I haven't stopped struggling yet. I need you to be generous today so that this valuable organization can continue to produce more movement children, because it is from God we come, and to him is all of our return. And in between, there's nothing but toil and struggle. Peace be upon those who practice righteousness.
It's a long song. Still got our service greater, 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 greater than the ordinary. So I'm gonna give him all I have in this moment. Have a preacher say you should be woke now. <laughs> Just a few words. The uh, you know people get confused about the NAACP. We are not a legal services organization. No matter how egregious the issues are, we have to have help. <clears throat> We're not a job placement center. Although we know that poverty negatively affects every aspect of life for Americans of indigenous African descent. We cannot reprimand prosecutors that routinely wink, wink at the offenses of white men but overcharge black ones. We cannot remove judges that sentence black men more harshly or principles that expel black children at an alarming rate. What we are is an advocacy organization that is hated by a segment of white America and ignored by much of black America. The Atlanta branch is one of 3,000 branches and units nationwide of the NAACP staffed and managed by committed volunteers tasked with negating the systemic racist policies, practices, and laws that continue to oppress people of color. Our effort is imperfect, but our mission is not only noble, but essential to the almost 600,000 African-American babies born last year, who in just a few years will face the prospect of barriers to voting, education, job opportunities, and justice that is not only not blind, but winks and grins at the inequities that people of color face in America. These babies will face an America that has accepted racism as a political platform instead of the criminal evil that it is, an evil that is endorsed by federal, state, and local governments in the form of celebrations to Confederate States of America recognitions of its beginning, and monuments to its leaders. These symbols of racism went largely in, unchallenged in the 20th century as we struggled to achieve civil rights that were met with new monuments that declared white supremacy. After World War II, the Marshall Plan was passed to help rebuild the infrastructure of devastated Europe. <clears throat> Where is the plan to rebuild the black community economically depressed, psychologically devastated, and spiritually broken? We have just seen an election where, again, black men, scarred by ap apathy and despair, largely passed on the one instrument of power at their disposal, the right to vote. Less than half of Georgia's black registered black men who were registered voters bothered to cast a ballot. There were enough uncast votes by black men in Fulton County alone to deny the election of the voter suppressor in chief. <laughs> Our role this year must be to educate the community neighborhood by neighborhood, and we need your help. <clears throat> Every church ought to have at least one person who is active in the NAACP and all of our activities. Every church. <laughs> Every black man or woman with a job or a pension 
<laughs> should be a member of the local NAACP branch. Those with these fine positions in corporate America that were won largely with the efforts of the NAACP should make an annual donation to the local NAAC branch. As Griggs pointed out earlier today, it's the 156th year since the Emancipation Proclamation, and slavery is a horrendous blight on America's past. But the racism on which it was based has continued, almost unabated by too many to the extent that blacks and white accept it as a norm. I submit to you that we must be alarmed by the circumstances under which 600,000 black babies are born and to commit ourselves to an urgency of purpose. The tensions caused by racism are now heightened by the current occupant of the White House. We cannot just accept them. It is the duty of the oppressed to resist. I ask each of you to do more, to give more, to join us to repair America, repair its racist systems, abolish its racist symbology, demand that America live up to its creed that all men are created equal, even if the carvings at Stone Mountain say otherwise. If the ushers will now come, Reverend Durley, if you join me here, you don't need a good, fine Baptist preacher to beg. <laughs> I'm an accountant. I'm, I'm used to counting the money. <laughs> it's done when it gets to me. <laughs> Rev. Reverend Durley is going to tell us how important he is in, a, in, a, in his spiritual manner. <laughs> Come on, us. <laughs> Let us all stand. Touch your wallets and your pocketbooks. <laughs> now yesterday y'all ran and gave money to all kinds of things. You just finished going in debt around Christmas time. This is a time, an anointed time, when you can come and give back to the NAACP. We had a leader once here in the NAACP said that if you want the dog to bite, you've got to feed it. NAAC is a big dog and it's going to take some big funds. So whatever you have in your hand right now, pull it out, pull it out. Some of you already made a decision. I'm going to bring my dollar. <clears throat> oh, four dollars there. I'm sorry. Whatever you have in your hand right now, listen to me. Whatever you have in your hand, whatever you position to give, proposition to give, double it right now. Now, don't cuss me out. Just double the money. Amen. All of you who are willing to give a little bit more than you thought you were going to give, say amen. amen. I didn't hear you. Reverend Russell, did you hear him say amen? It's time for giving now. Eternal and almighty God, we thank you for the gift that they're ready to give right now. We thank you for the work of the NAACP. We thank you for what it means and what it will continue to do in the liberation of all people, in the liberation of bringing this company back to, country back together. So now let us give joyously. As we come forth, let us give joy. For those who are going to give joyously, let us say hallelujah. Thank God. Praise God and we give. Amen. This is a joyous time. You may sit down and just, as the plates come by you, you sit down. And you put it in, just say thank you, God. As you put it in, to the glory of God and to the glory of the NAACP.
might feel guilty that you didn't have enough today, we'll be in the office tomorrow. Just give us a call. Thank you. cards as well for those who did not have the resources today please make a pledge for the ongoing either monthly weekly or annually for this great organization we thank all of you who have given today God we thank you for this bountiful blessing and we ask that it will be used for the uplifting of not only your kingdom here on earth but also for the welfare and the being of each one of us who have committed our lives to freedom justice and equality we ask it all in the name of all of the great prophets we say Amen, Shalom, and Assalamu Alaikum. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karen Renee, and uh, I am a proud member of the Atlanta NAACP. <laughs> it's my job to introduce our guest speaker, Congressman Hank Johnson. Yeah. Yes. Um, I remember when he was first elected as congressman um, to United States congressman. And uh, he serves now as the fourth congressional district, which encompasses parts of DeKalb County, Gwinnett, and Newton County, and all of Rockdale County. But his reach goes far beyond those. He's one of the most powerful congressmen in the United States. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you something that's not in his bio. I'll never forget, um, I used to work at Job Corps. I was one of their administrators on staff and he had such a great heart for young people in education. And we asked him if he would come out and uh, talk to our young folks and give them inspiration and inspire them. And he was downtown at the state um, offices uh, over at the governor's mansion, well actually under the Georgia Dome. And they were running late and we had all the kids packed up in a hot gym and we were just waiting on them to get there. And I told the, our security team to say, when he got there, just give me a call. Now, we had worked together before on some other programs, but we, we were still brand new, still brand new. So when he pulled up to the security, uh, they said, Miss Renee, he's out there. So I ran out and I said, give me your car. And he looked at me like, girl, <laughs> he had this brand new Jeep, brand new Jeep, no tag on it. I said, give me your car. Uh, I'm gonna walk you in, I'm gonna introduce you on stage, and I'll go park it for you. And he looked at me, he, said, he like, man, I done had a rough day already. <laughs> you about to take me from my car. <laughs> so I said, look, I don't have all day, you got kids in there. <laughs> we got kids in there that have been waiting on you. And so he trusted me, and he gave me the keys to his car. We walked him in, he went right on stage, he did his thing, and our young people, man, they were inspired. And every time I've had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., when Job Corps here in Atlanta was in trouble, 
He didn't fail to pick up the phone to figure out how we could help. This man cares about his community. When you have an elected official in the community that don't mind pulling up their sleeves, working hard side by side with their constituents, making a way for young people who may not have hope, I tell you, today you have a great speaker, you have a great man with a great heart who wants to unite us and wants us to stand with him as he fights his battles on Capitol Hill. I introduce you today as one of the greatest people that I've ever met when his heart is in the game, Congressman Hank Johnson. Thank you. Well, Councilwoman Renee, you did that just like we rehearsed it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Reverend Dr. Wills, Bishop Guthrie, Rabbi Nimhauser, Imam Suleiman Ali, members of Friendship Baptist Church, elected officials, pastors, dignitaries, NAACP officials, brothers and sisters, I'm honored to be here to address such a beautiful crowd on such a historic day, an important day in our history, in such an historic edifice as Friendship Baptist Church. I sincerely trust that everyone has had a joyous holiday season, blessed to be surrounded with family and friends. As we celebrate the arrival of a new year, let us be prayerful for those who have passed on while being thankful that we have lived to see another day. Happy New Year, everyone. I want to thank the Atlanta NAACP under the leadership of my good friend Richard Rose and also my good friend attorney Gerald Griggs for inviting me to deliver remarks on this first day of 2019. I also want to thank the Reverend Dr. Richard W. Wills Sr. and the historic Friendship Baptist Church family for hosting us today. The tyranny of slavery was in full force and effect as Reverend Frank Quarles set about organizing a church, a spiritual oasis amidst the harsh reality and cruelty of everyday life under the institution of slavery. The tyranny of slavery was all that Reverend Quarles and the members of Friendship Baptist Church had ever known. Friendship Baptist Church was established in 1862, though the members came together first in 1861. But in 1862, it was established just one year, or just shortly before, months before, the Emancipation Proclamation became effective as law in 1863. I can imagine Friendship's founder, Reverend Quarles, and his flock with anxious visions of freedom from the shackles of slavery, huddled together on watch night, 1862, singing spirituals and praying for freedom. They awaited the start of the new year, January 1st, 1863, Jubilee Day. Independence Day for black people, the day when the Emancipation Proclamation and executive order issued by President Abraham Lincoln would become and imagine how much joy and hope the members of Friendship Baptist Church The arrival of Jubilee Day, January 1st, 1863. Can you imagine how they must have felt? Free at last, they must have felt when the clock struck midnight. Ladies and gentlemen, if Prince had been alive that night, he would have wrote a song 
tonight I'm going to party like it's 1862. I believe that Reverend Quarles must have been a leader of great vision, neighborliness, and benevolence. His vision was grounded in his Christian faith and establishing a church for the spiritual well-being of his people. So with faith, hope, love, and the dream of being free one day, he established a little church called Friendship because he was a neighborly man of goodwill. He had the ability to call upon friends up north at the Ninth Street Baptist Church in Cincinnati for help when he needed a place for his members to hold worship services. The folks at Ninth Street Baptist Church purchased an old railroad boxcar and had it shipped from Chattanooga to Atlanta for the church to utilize as its first edifice. The Reverend Quarles' benevolence was manifested by his understanding of the role that education would play in the uplifting and development of black people. Reverend Quarles opened the church to Morehouse and Spelman students who attended classes in the basement of the church. Look how far Spelman, Morehouse, and the Atlanta University Center have come. Look how far Atlanta, Georgia, the South, and the nation have come. And look how far Friendship Baptist Church has come. Now under the leadership of the Reverend Dr. Wills, only the seventh pastor in Friendship's 156 years. If the history of Friendship Baptist Church and the black people in Atlanta and across America does not represent a true embodiment of emancipation, I don't know what does. Friendship Baptist Church is symbolic of the progress that black folks have achieved in America. And I believe Reverend Quarles is looking down from heaven, glowing with pride and approval at the progress that the church he gave birth to has achieved. So it is today, 156 years later, Black folks again gather at Friendship Baptist Church to celebrate Jubilee Day, our Independence Day, and to reflect on the reality that we still have much work left to do to make our country great, free, and free for all people. America is a great country, and America is an exceptional nation because of the freedoms enshrined in the Constitution, which her citizens enjoy. Ironically, the wise and learned framers of our Constitution never intended for the rights and privileges guaranteed thereunder to apply to dark-skinned human beings or to women. The white male property owners who were the great thinkers who framed the Constitution meant for its protections to apply only amongst themselves. Fortunately for us, over the course of history, it has been the United States Supreme Court that has been the branch of government that black people have relied upon to ensure our due process and equal protection under the law. Last I'm hopeful that you are playing praying just as hard as I am that she make a speedy and full recovery. Amen. Despite all of the progress that we have made in America and despite the beautiful skies this morning that greeted us, despite that, heavy storm clouds are on the horizon. Our democracy teeters on the brink of failure. The lofty ideals of freedom and liberty that America was founded upon are being overtaken by a vigorous resurgence of bigotry, hate, cruelty, and ignorance. 
Chaos and confusion ruled the day, while lies and deception flourish as complicit leaders stand silent, protecting their own power and privilege rather than fulfilling their oaths to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. A powerful domestic enemy of democracy has emerged from the dark shadows of America. The same thing is happening in other countries around the world. In fact, the attack on democracy and freedom is a trend sweeping the world. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the demise of the Eastern Bloc and the move towards freedom and democracy, the people of Eastern Europe, countries like Poland and Hungary, are electing far-right conservative nationalist leaders who are rolling back democracy. Those authoritarian leaders are pushing laws that do away with freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And they are strangling the independence of their judicial systems. The people of Turkey elected an authoritarian president who has moved to suppress human rights of the Turkish people. The people of Great Britain, in response to a right-wing, anti-immigrant inspired Brexit campaign, voted to leave the Euro European Union. The financial hub of the European Union is leaving the European Union. That's like New York seceding from the United States of America. The people of Brazil recently elected as president a right-wing, racist, authoritarian nationalist. History is repeating itself ac across the globe. The same trend towards authoritarian rule, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, is playing out right here at home, where Americans elected an authoritarian, anti-immigrant, racist, strong man to the nation's highest office. Donald Trump and his Make America Great Again followers who want to return America back to a time when white men and white privilege were unchallenged and where minorities and women were in their place. These folks now control the highest office of the land. Donald Trump supporters are older, less educated, less prosperous, and they are dying early. Their lifespans are decreasing, and many are dying from alcoholism, drug overdoses, liver disease, or simply a broken heart caused by economic despair. In America, as in other nations across the world, global economic forces have disrupted national economies, and people are finding themselves caught between growing economic inequality and a bleak economic future for themselves and their children. Right-wing ideologues gain power by playing on people's economic despair, pitting working people against each other, inflaming racial tensions by blaming economic hardship on people of color. The reality is that these right-wing authoritarians are laissez-faire free market capitalists with insatiable thirst for more and more profits. Under their leadership, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and freedom and liberty hang in the balance. Brothers and sisters, America as we know it is in trouble. For the unlearned, the unwise, and the foolish, and for those who are asleep, history can repeat itself. These are times when we cannot sleep. We must stay woke. Democracy is a majority rules system. When people are apathetic and don't vote or are victims of voter suppression, then the majority of those who do vote control what happens to everyone else. If that majority votes 
on the basis of hatred, lies, ignorance, selfishness, etc., then freedom for some is tenuous. If the conditions are just right, freedom in the hands of a simple majority with a collective malignant heart can lead to tyranny. Tyranny in the form of slavery has been a reality in this country before, and we must be diligent to ensure that it does not happen again. The Jewish people understand tyranny. Charismatic and a good public speaker, deceptive and cunning, Adolf Hitler rose to power to lead Germany in 1932 after democratic elections. He rode a wave of nationalism and anti-Semitism to power, replace anti-Semitism with all Latinos crossing our borders, our rapists, drug dealers, and murderers. Does that sound familiar? Hitler was accepting of violence towards the achievement of political objectives. Trump encouraged violence against protesters at his rallies. And his messaging about Charlottesville, that there were bad people on both sides, sent a powerful message of approval to the far-right racists in America. Hitler led a political movement of anti-education, anti-science racists who focused on nationalism with rhetoric about making Germany a strong country, which would result in prosperity for the German people who were hurting due to the disruption caused by the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the effects of the Great Depression. Sound familiar? His aim was to unite the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Germanic, Aryan people against the Jews, the Italians, the Polish, anybody else. Hitler did not start the Nazi party, but he took over the party with charisma and leadership. The Nazis and Hitler became synonymous. Much like Hitler took over the Nazi party, Trump has taken over the Republican Party. It's now known as the Trump Republican Party. Trump's vow during the campaign, stop Muslims from coming into our country. That became a reality, ladies and gentlemen. Having been elected president, Trump signed an executive order banning people from certain Muslim countries from entering America. And the US Supreme Court, ignoring Trump's own words, allowed the Muslim ban to go forward. That was not the first time the U.S. Supreme Court has gotten it wrong with an executive order. In 1944, it ruled constitutional an executive order mandating the internment of Japanese American citizens of the United States of America. 1944, U.S. Supreme Court, Korematsu. These folks, Japanese people, were full-fledged American citizens. They weren't here on tourist visas. They were born here. They just simply had Japanese heritage. Can you imagine how they decided who was Japanese and who, who was not? They probably put all the Oriental people in internment, whether or not you were from China, Thailand. They all look the same, right? 1944, U.S. Supreme Court, executive order. Hitler also gained influence with military leaders, and the 1932 elections were flooded with special interest money from conservatives, wealthy conservatives, and industrialists, and other special interests. Our United States Supreme Court got that one wrong, too, ladies and gentlemen with its citizen, with its decision in Citizens United, which opened the floodgates for special interest money to overtake our political process. When Hitler became chancellor, his supporters marched through Berlin with torches, 
I'm reminded of the tiki torches that the racist anti-Semites paraded through Charlottesville with, chanting, quote, Jews won't replace us, end quote. Is history poised to repeat itself? Hitler's followers physically attacked his political enemies while others maintained silence in fear, hoping that things would get better. Trump calls his critics in the media enemies of the state, enemies of the people, and he rouses up crowds at his rallies into a frenzy against the media in attendance, causing some in the media to feel unsafe. Germans in high positions of power and influence used to say that Hitler was a mediocre leader who would not be allowed to do too much damage to German institutions of democracy and that Germany, with its freedom of speech and thought and the diversity of its people, could never fall into dictatorship. In the book entitled On Tyranny by Timothy Snyder, the author writes about how the people of Germany assumed that the institutions of government could survive attacks by Hitler and his supporters, and he noted how even German Jews, despite Hitler's rabid anti-Semitism, made the mistake of minimizing the harm that could come from Hitler's ascension to power. He quotes an editorial dated February 2nd, 1933, from a permanent, prominent German Jewish newspaper, which expressed the mislaid trust of its editor as follows, quote, we do not subscribe to the view that Mr. Hitler and his friends now finally in possession of the power they have so long desired will implement the proposal circulating in Nazi newspapers. They will not suddenly deprive German Jews of their constitutional rights, nor enclose them in ghettos, nor subject them to the jealous and murderous impulses of the mob. They cannot do this because of a number of crucial factors hold power in check, and they clearly do not want to go down that road. When one acts as a European power, the whole atmosphere tends towards ethical reflection upon one's better self and away from revisiting one's earlier oppositional posture, end quote. That was the view held by many Germans shortly before, shortly after Hitler came to power. Brothers and sisters, after six million Jews perished in the Holocaust, the Jewish people will always be diligent to make sure that history does not repeat itself. Americans, particularly black Americans, can't afford to make that same mistake about the harm that could be done by a man named Hitler or a man named Trump. Although Trump is a threat to the freedom and liberty of every American, black people should be particularly vigilant given the knowledge that when white folks catch a cold in America, black folks catch pneumonia. So brothers and sisters, I feel so good about what the American people did on this past November 6th when they voted Democrats in to take over the House of Representatives. If that small step had not happened, I would be much less optimistic about America's future and black folks' future in America than I feel today. The Trump Republican Party so far has shown itself to be a party that will permit Donald Trump to get away with killing someone on Fifth Avenue in broad daylight and still support him. A Democratic House of Representatives will not allow Trump to get away with trampling and trampling the rule of law. But I can't guarantee that the United States Supreme Court will uphold our freedom from an unjust Trump executive order. So I'm concerned about the highest court in the land. I'm concerned about that there could be something that would happen 
to either Kagan, Breyer, Sotomayor, or Ginsburg that could render them unable to serve. And then Donald Trump would be able to appoint another Brett Kavanaugh to the court. Did y'all see those, that, those hearings? In a way that this Supreme Court justice acted, he actually put on a show for the man who appointed him. I don't know what he's going to do as a U.S. Supreme Court justice with a lifetime appointment. I'm concerned about Trump's ability to appoint another Brett Kavanaugh to the court. Despite ratification in 1868 of the 14th Amendment, guaranteeing the black folks due process and equal protection under the law of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1896, ruled that segregation of the races was legal. The court's decision in Plessy versus Ferguson enshrined Jim Crow into the law for 58 more years before it was overturned. Most recently in Shelby County versus Holder, the U.S. Supreme Court, ignoring volumes of evidence, gutted the Voting Rights Act. Ever since black folks' precious right to vote, ever since then, black folks' precious right to vote has been systematically denied, with the effect being the election of Brian Kemp as Georgia's next governor. So we can't afford to go to sleep. We must stay woke. We must take action to protect and safeguard our democracy. This is our country, and we must assume the duty to fight to ensure that America lives up to her democratic values of liberty, equality, and justice for all. Today, brothers and sisters, represents a fresh beginning, New Year's Day, a chance to start anew, make resolutions, lose weight, exercise more, eat better, wipe the slate clean. But it's also an opportunity to look back on our history, to appreciate how the past has shaped our present and put us on a path where we are on today to shape our destiny yet to come. So let us begin this new year by renewing our bonds to one another and reinvesting in the work that lies ahead, confident that we can keep driving freedom's progress in our time. Let us, let me say once again, let us begin this new year by renewing our bonds to one another and reinvesting in the work that lies ahead, confident that we can keep driving freedom's progress in our time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. How about Congressman Johnson? Thank you so much. I'll just take a few more minutes. Uh, we have uh, just a few people we want to recognized for their contributions. You know, we, uh, community service is a 365 day thing, but on the first day, we want to recognize people who have made contributions of unselfishness. I want to first start with members of uh, the Atlanta NAACP Executive Committee, uh, Dr. Martha Plowden, who has shepherded our AXO program for, uh, I'm not going to call the number of years I want to talk about them, but <laughs> for quite a few years. Uh, she is a member of the executive committee. She was a member uh, when I was serving as treasurer. And when I came back to serve as president, she was still here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Atlanta Branch NACP, for this recognition. In my opinion, one of the highest recognitions you can receive is from your peers. Again, Atlanta Branch, thank you. Uh, another, this has become a friend of mine, 
uh, my partner in trouble, <laughs> who is a uh, pastor First Iconium Baptist Church. <laughs> Reverend Tim McDonald, would you please come forward? Uh, <laughs> you cannot say enough about his service as a member of the Concerned Black Clergy, a leader of the Concerned Black Clergy, and just a firebrand in this community. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm humbled. Another member of our executive committee who, who came on with, because I asked him to. I've known uh, Mac Willis for uh, a generation. <laughs> and so, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have made alliances in, uh, in my business career. And uh, he was one of those who has, who is, when I asked him to do, and I asked him to come and support us, he came and he has been a stalwart in terms of making sure uh, when we needed to run an ad, he wrote a check. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we want to honor Julius Mac Willis, who is also the uh, founder and owner of Somerset Assisted Living. Uh, his wife is with him. <laughs> Thank you. Can I say a word? Uh, I'm going to take just two minutes, but. I had this on my mind as I was sitting there this morning, and I think it'd be remiss if I didn't say this. Um, I know Richard Rose is going to recognize Councilman Renee and all these folks that did the great job of putting this program together and convincing the pastor here, making available this beautiful sanctuary. But something Richard Rose falls a little short on is recognizing himself. He, he, uh, he invited me to come and join this organization and got elected to the board. And he called me one night and just like James Brown, he said, you got to get on up. <laughs> and I got on up. First night, I got a lifetime membership. He had me on a roll. But the thing he didn't tell you is that I would call Richard sometimes, this is decades ago, and I got an accounting issue. I'm going to take a chance and call Richard. I don't care what time of night it is, he might answer. He picks up the phone. He's in his office. And I'm going to share a long-running joke with you. I said, that Richard, here it is late at night. I said, the boys down at the club running out of money, they're standing with the blinds peeped over looking out the window. I said, they're waiting on you. He said, tell them I'll be there when my work is done. So if you ever walk into that nondescript bar and see the boys peeping out the window, you tell them that his work ain't done yet. <laughs> God bless you. So back in, the, back in the early days, the, uh, you know, I, half of my civil rights foot is in SCLC and the other in the NAACP. And, uh, but all of us used to say what we scared most of all was us. We didn't want a scared lawyer. This ex honoree is nothing like a scared lawyer. Wayne Kendall will attack the Giants and the Giants family. <laughs> and we appreciate him for what he's done. Come up, Wayne. So this is the man who not only disagreed with, with Fayette County that they elected all the county commissioners at large, he did something about it. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. I did want to say a couple of words. Um, first of all, I want to thank my family for being here, my wife, my daughters, my brother-in-law, sister-in-law, my son-in-law, and the best-looking granddaughter in America. 
Yesterday, I was uh, in Hancock County, Sparta, Georgia, uh, driving down a, a little muddy dirt road to a double wide trailer to visit my clients whose son had been in a police shooting, another police shooting, 22 year old black man. A little bit different from the normal police shooting though because uh, this time uh, the claim was that he was armed and that he shot himself four times. Once in the back of the head, once in the abdomen, once in the chest, and once in the back. So as I was driving down that little muddy dirt road to visit my client on a double wide trailer, I never thought about the fact that less than 24 hours later I'd be standing in this grand edifice before you with senators and council people and congressmen accepting this award. But it's those kinds of things that I do all the time and have been doing for the last 20 or 30 years that I'm most proud of, things that you don't get awards for. And I don't know why Richard gave me this award, but uh, I appreciate it and I accept it humbly. Thank you. So I just want to recognize a few people, uh, starting with the program participants. Uh, Imam, don't leave yet. <laughs> <laughs> The people I asked to participate, none of them hesitated. I mean, not a breath between yes. And I'd like to think it's because they recognize that there's a new movement of righteousness that must overcome the forces of divisiveness, bigotry, and narcissism. And uh, if y'all could just stand, uh, just be recognized again, I appreciate it. I, I thank them for coming. <clears throat> Thank you. Our music, uh, Lee Franklin and his group, Psalms 150. Where's Lee? One of these days, Lee's going to... One of these days, haven't yet. One of these days, Lee's going to say no to something I asked him to do. <laughs> Hadn't happened yet. Let's keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, my civil rights compadre, compadre, Charles Steele, president of SCLC. Would you give a stand? Uh, other NAACP, uh, all active members of the NAACP, would you stand, wherever you are? Thank you. I see Johnny Jones, uh, just be at Fayette County, Atlanta NAACP, thank you. The, uh, would elected officials stand? I, you, uh, Felicia Moore, President of Atlanta City Council, Dina Holiday Ingram, who's Mayor of East Point, District Attorney Paul Howard, uh, Hank, Hank Johnson's wife, Marita Johnson, who's uh, in uh, DeKalb County Commission, Matt Westmoreland, my friend from, who was uh, Atlanta Board of Education, now he's uh, City Council. And, and we all, in ACP, we know Marie Metz, who, Dr. Metz, who was, uh, who's a state representative. Stand up again, Ms. Dr. Metz, because we've been, we've been at it a long time. <laughs> And of course, our, our, our newly elected first, second vice president of Atlanta NAACP, Carol Renee, who's uh, East Point City Council. <clears throat> and I couldn't, I, you know, I can't not recognize a happy preacher. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got a special guest from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, which you stand. There's a delegation here which you stand. Thank you so much for coming. The, uh, the national office has formed an alliance with the LDS community across the country and Atlanta's know we follow in suit. Um, and last but not least, we want to recognize, thank again, uh, give uh, Congressman Johnson something else to put somewhere that we hope we'll <laughs> accept this Accept this plaque of uh, appreciation for the message he brought for his continued work in the community. Uh, my, my fellow Clark Act, I had to get that in, but 
Thank you so much. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs>